by the 2023 Daytona 500 champion Ricky Stenhouse, driver of the number 47 Kroger Cottonelle Chevrolet for JTG Doherty Racing. Um, just give us your thoughts about winning the Great American Race, Ricky. Uh, man, I think back to really all week, but really think back to this morning. Um, I woke up and felt really, really good about the day. I was, I normally don't get nervous, but I was a little, little nervous, uh, but like anxious and excited, ready to go. Um, my wife and I, Madison, we went to the gym and did a small little workout just to, to get going this morning. And, um, you know, just, you know, felt relaxed, uh, felt good about, about the day. Um, knew our car was strong after Friday's practice. Uh, Mike and uh, our engineers made some really good adjustments after the duels uh, on Thursday and, and felt really good about our car. We did two 20 lap runs and, and stayed on the same set of tires for, for that practice session on Friday night and, and felt good with, with the adjustments that we made and, and it, the car did everything that I needed it to do. Uh, the only thing that we didn't have when we started the race was track position. Uh, we started 31st and first stage I felt like it was getting a little hectic up front and it was just kind of a parking lot. We were just you know side by side for, for the whole stage and so we just kind of rode around and um, just kind of watched it and then we got track position there in the second stage. was able to get some points. I felt like uh, you know we might have got snookered a little bit there on you know the strategy a lot pitted uh, but you know it was nice to get up front and learn what the car was doing up front, uh, which I think was beneficial for, you know, once we, you know, had those restarts late. And, you know, once once uh, we sped on pit road, I uh, kind of thought our race was over, but I felt like the good Lord was watching out for us. I was serving the penalty and uh, and then all of a sudden they had a, you know, big wreck right there, kind of where we were running, uh, getting in turn one. So that gave us a second chance and I knew that uh, my team was Tuesday's meeting was not going to be very good because uh, we preached all, all season about not beating ourselves and, and there I went speed on pit road um, just trying to get uh, really wasn't trying to get everything out of it but uh, got a little too much and so I felt like once the caution came out I really had to kind of put my elbows up and, and get back to the front to give us another shot to win uh, so I at least could you know tell my guys that, that we had a shot to win and you know, once it, once we got up there, you know, the eight, three, twenty-four, and myself. Um, obviously, we cleared the seventeen and six, and, and put all Chevys in the top four. And then I was blocking the twenty-two, and he got up underneath me, and I kind of thought our race was over at that point. And then we had that restart. Um, the seventeen six chose the bottom, which kind of shocked me a little bit. Uh, gave us uh, the six starting position behind the twenty-two. And with the eight and three on the front row, I thought that they might try kind of the old school restart of, you know, pulling down in front of each other. And I knew that that would give our outside lane uh, a huge run off of two. Uh, Kyle was pushing me like crazy down the back stretch. And I waited just long enough to, to go to the bottom once he was clear as well. And that gave us the lead. I was hoping we were going to get back to the wide at that moment. And we didn't. Uh, big wreck behind us. And again a, a perfect scenario for me uh you know i picked the top i felt like our car was better on the top and i knew kyle was going to take the front row you can't give a give up a front row starting position i was just hoping that bell was going to go third because i felt like logano uh, and that manufacturer was a really good pusher and so once we went green you know we got the lead i was a little nervous because we were low on fuel our, our low fuel light started you know, flashing at me and so i knew we needed to get back to the white and once we did that, I felt like we could make it all the way back around. Uh, but the 22 had a huge run, got to my outside. Kyle had a huge run, and he kind of shipped the middle. And then I looked in my mirror, and, and here comes Christopher, gave me a big shot uh, down the short shoot there into one, and then uh, got out front enough for when the caution came out. So everything played out perfectly for us at the end of that. I mean, it's a Daytona 500. Um, you're gonna, it's a long race. You're gonna have. Good parts and bad parts, uh, but we just, you know, we just kept pushing through. Yeah, I want to start up front here with Lee, and then we'll go over to Jordan. Congratulations. Thank you. I talked to Mike Bright after the race, and he said that you took him somewhere he had never been before, and now it was up for him to take you back. And he was going to stop until he got you back to where you deserved to be. You had that kind of relationship with somebody, and before you were 
Mary would say you guys shared it twice. Yes, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you just you know, reflect on that and somebody who cares enough about you to see you to the end? Yeah, I think it was, you know, really big for myself. You know, I mean, not winning since 2017, um, having struggles, ups and downs, you know, to have somebody like Mike who, you know, when he took over the reins as soon as the season was over, um, it was, hey, you know, I know you can still get this done. We just got to give you the right opportunities. Um, we know that if we give you cars capable of running up front, you can do that. We've, we've proven that. And, you know, I felt like his leadership throughout the whole shop is, is, you know, still not even, I mean, yeah, we won here at the Daytona 500, but I still think, you know, the fruits of that is gonna come later on from, you know, his leadership in the shop and, and making sure, you know, most of these guys that we have are the same guys we had last year, but, uh, you know, he, he believes in myself uh, more, than, more than I do, I think, and, and that, that's huge, um, I feel like, that's what separates crew chiefs these days is, you know, that, that team aspect and, and leading your guys and getting the most out of them. We all have similar equipment, and that wasn't always the case uh, in this sport. So now it's, you know, little nuances like that that help, you know, propel a race team forward. You know, we all felt confident this off season, but it's, uh, it's special to do it with Mike. We've accomplished so much together. We've gone through ups and downs. He's been in the sport a long time. He's a cup champion. Uh, you know, as a car chief with Kurt Busch, uh, we, we, I think he's won this race before, um, not as a crew chief, obviously, uh, in our Nationwide Series championships and, um, and race wins were, were something that we're super proud of. But we know that those were 10 years ago, and, and, and we need to make some new memories. Jordan, then the Bob, and then the gentleman. Jordan, thank you. I have a few questions for me. Um, what makes you such a good super speedway racer? Uh, and I don't know. Uh, so when we were in the Nationwide Series, it really wasn't one of my favorite things to do. Um, I We had some good runs, but I, I don't feel like I knew exactly what I was doing. I was always you know, looking forward to the mile and a half racetracks in the Nationwide Series. Um, you know, In my cup career, we got some good finishes in um, in super speedway racing, but it was more of, you know, laying in the back, missing the wrecks, uh, not really being on the offense. And then when I was at Roush Fenway, Jimmy Finning kind of took over uh, our speedway program and felt like at that moment, he, he gave us cars that had speed, that you could go on the offense, that you could make, you know, big runs, you could make passes, you could learn the side draft. And I felt like that's when I learned a lot about, you know, super speedway racing and, and really felt confident, you know, to make runs and studied, you know, what the leaders were doing, how they were staying up front. I mean, I feel like at the end of the races, there's generally, you know, similar guys at the front of these races. And, uh, and it's, yeah, some of it's luck, but, you know, a lot of it's skill and, um, and your spotter, you know, the way y'all work together. Uh, Mike Herman Jr., when we were at Roush Fenway, Felt like he was a really good super speedway spotter. Um, Tab Boyd came on the market last off, you know, last off season, two seasons ago, and and we were lucky enough to pick him up. And I felt like that, you know, kind of upped our game over here at JTG Doherty Racing on the um, on the super speedways, and you know they gave me fast race cars as well. So uh, it takes a combination of of all those things. In your, in your opinion, what do you think has been holding JTG back from making that next step? That you see other good sized teams take. Well, I think, you know, I came from Roush Fenway Racing and, you know, I saw all the resources uh, that they had and, and the support from, from the manufacturer. And then I went to JTG Doherty Racing and honestly, I was surprised at how much, you know, nice equipment and how they ran things um, and, and how much of the car they actually built. Um, you know, I wasn't 100% sure, you know, what it was going to look like when I went into the race shop. But now, you know, for us to, you know, kind of take that next step, obviously this is our second season uh, with this new car and we've got more help from, from Chevrolet. We've been in the simulator uh, way more this off season than we were all of last year. And uh, things like that, uh, the resources that, that Chevy's gonna help us out with, our alliance that, um, you know, we've, we've built with Rick, Rick Hendrick Racing. Um, you know, Rick's been a, a great supporter of 
JTG Doherty Racing in the past. We've been using their engines. So I think that's going to be a, a huge help for us as well. Uh, you know, like Mike said, I, I caught the tail end of it there. You know, this is huge for us, uh, but I'm honestly super excited to get to Fontana, uh, Las Vegas. Obviously, we had a, a decent test at, at Phoenix. We weren't where we need to be on the short tracks yet, but the, we were so far off last year uh, that, you know, the things that we've had, at, um, you know, our tools that we've had this off season, we feel like we've made those short tracks better already, and, and we're looking forward to getting to those racetracks. Does, when you come to Daytona and Talladega, are you going to win? Is your confidence much, much higher than it would be elsewhere? Definitely, uh, but I think everybody's is. Um, you know, but when you've been to a racetrack where you've been to Victory Lane in the Cup Series, uh, you know how um, you know how it works. The position that we put ourselves in this race last year, I think we led. Uh, I don't know. I was rewatching it right actually as I was getting ready uh, to go out to the grid today. Uh, you know, we were we were leading. You know, the last 20 or so laps here last year, and and we got crashed there on a late race restart with five to go. But uh, I told my guys this off season uh, coming into this week, if if we can get in that same position again, I would take it, and and hopefully things worked out a little bit better. And. Uh, and there we were with you know a green white checkered. We we had the lead and uh, controlled the restart. And um, yeah, so I definitely have confidence coming back to these places. It was Bob. It was Jonathan from the press box. Yeah, that was uh, 2019. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was, you know, um, something unexpected. Uh, honestly, I kind of thought I had a contract in 2023. <laughs> um, so that was the uh, kind of crazy part about all that. Um, and so, you know, my management team, uh, Josh Jones at KHI, jumped on the call uh, on the phone as soon as, you know, we uh, met with, with Roush Finway at the time. Um, and you know, got a hold of uh, Tad and, and Ernie, and um, you know, started working the doors there. And I had some great partners with uh, Sunny D, Sunny D, who also you know stepped up and uh, and called on my behalf. And so, had a great, a lot of great supporters, um, you know, that uh, I felt confident in uh, of, of getting me um, you know a, a a good job. And you know, when I got over to JTG Doherty Racing, like I said, I, I didn't know what to expect, um, but I was super impressed with, um, you know, their whole race team and, and how they ran it. And, you know, I was looking forward to getting this car, you know, technically a year prior, because uh, I felt like, you know, once we were, you know, in comparable equipment to everybody else, uh, that, you know, they had all the right people to, you know, to get the most out of the race cars. And, and I felt like, you know, we could, I could do the job behind the wheels. So, um, yeah, we had done my contract a lot earlier than we announced it. So, like, I think, I don't know, maybe you asked me about it and I forgot that we had already done it a long time ago. So, um, you know, I I don't think we show up to the racetrack. We, we you know, JTG Doherty Racing's got realistic expectations. Um, you know, we, we, we were building this program together. We were excited when we got, you know, like I said, a, a car that was comparable to everybody else's. Um, and no, knowing it was going to be some growing pains over last season, uh, we knew that. You know, there was there was times we had a lot of hope. Uh, we went a month straight with, you know, our worst finish of eight, but then we kind of fell off. But, you know, the bigger teams were able to learn a lot more at a faster rate, and I felt like that's what got us behind. So, you know, this off season we've really focused on that. And like I said, I'm excited to go to these racetracks uh, like Fontana, Las Vegas, uh, and really see the potential that we've gained over this off season. Good question up in the press box after Jonathan. John Biel, race and experts in ESPN Radio Albuquerque. You know, Ricky, you start a race when you're a young kid, and every kid dreams of winning the Daytona 500. I know you won here before in July, and but what was it like just? being out there in victory lane, being on the start finish line, just knowing that you were the champion. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, you know, like you said, I've been racing a long time. Uh, I grew up 
going to the racetrack. My mom took me to watch my dad when I was six weeks old. And I've been going to a racetrack for an average of 40 weekends a year, I would say, my whole life. And I came down here in 2006, Buckner. Jeff over here has been a long supporter of my career. Him and I, he he's a Tennessee guy. He had met with Bobby Hamilton at the time. His shop was in Nashville. We flew over there, walked through Bobby Hamilton's race shop. Uh, he invited us down the Daytona 500. We jumped in the tr er, for the, the truck race. We jumped down, and Bobby Hamilton won that race that year. And you could see an awkward kid standing behind him <laughs> like during his interview, and uh, that was me. And so that was in 2006, uh, and I was, uh, you know, impressed with this racetrack. I'd never been to anything like it. Um, I went to my first cup race was like the 92 Coke 600 back in the day, uh, but like I was finally old enough to you know kind of picture everything. And so since then, you know that was kind of the goal um, is is to try and get here and race. And then in 2008 was the first time I ever made laps around here in the Archer car. And um, you know I've gotten to race this racetrack when it was the old school racetrack where it was worn out, it was rough, a ton of fun. Uh, I feel like it's starting to get a little bit of that character back, but um, yeah, it's been a it's been a dream for a long time, and uh, you know, super super cool for uh, for us to be here. I remember seeing that clip around yeah. the internet in the background. Yeah, awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess just you know, going forward, you know, Mike talked about I guess you know finding your mojo again. Well, what do you, what does this win do for you already? And what do you want it to say? Yeah, I mean it's uh, you know we're not done. Uh, I think you know Mike and I got a lot of a lot of things left to do. Uh, again, it's been a short off season. Uh, I feel like we've you know Mike's moved the needle on where this race team's at. Uh, the, like I said, the resources I feel like we have now, um, you know, moving forward throughout the 2023 season, um, you know, there's still a lot left to prove that we can go be competitive, you know, on all racetracks and you know yeah it's a speedway win. Um, which is huge. It's the Daytona 500. You got you got to be able to win on them all. And you know, throughout my career, we've Mike and I have won on short tracks, mile and a half, and and super speedways. So uh, we do feel like mile and a half race tracks are probably our bread and butter right now with this race car, uh, excluding um, the super speedways. But uh, we know that we got a lot of work left to do on the short tracks. And so um, you know, yeah, this gives us a boost of confidence. But you know, I know we're going to enjoy this one tonight. Uh, but I know that you know everybody in the shop uh, and, and all these guys on this race team are, are looking forward to uh, getting to Fontana and, and kind of seeing where we shake out after everything we've learned. Press box. Bruce Martin with Speed Sport and with Ford Sports Money. Uh, Ricky, when you're a single car team and it's the end of the Daytona 500, even though you had some Chevys that were helping you out, do you feel like the lone wolf out there? Yes and no. Uh, you know, obviously throughout the whole race, you know, even, you know, I watched a lot of the, the first stage from, you know, my view. I could, I was close enough where I could just watch the leaders and I wasn't really doing any racing. So, yeah, I was watching all the teammates work really well together up there. We've had, you know, Chevy meetings this whole week and, and we preached about, you know, trying to get, you know, Chevrolet their, their 25th Daytona 500. And, you know, we talked about working together. We didn't do great uh, Thursday night in the duels. In the first duel, uh, we learned a lot, and you know, they transferred that on to to the second duel, and felt like our strategies worked really well today. Um, so that was huge for us. You know, like you said, when I got down to it, you know, the top four were Chevys at one point. I felt really good about that that we could kind of control the race. Uh, and then, you know, when the five lined up behind me. I knew that if we got a run, he would probably go with me, or I was really hoping so. Uh, and and we were able to, you know, kind of shut the 20, the 22 out, and uh, you know, both be first and second there. Uh, and then the last restart, you know, yes, you need teammates, but you know, at that moment, as long as you had a good pusher behind you, uh, I knew that 22 wasn't going to just, you know, go to the outside of me because you got to get the momentum going, uh, and the momentum's in, you know, numbers and. And I was confident in what Joey could do pushing me. And then it was kind of a free for all once you take the white plug. And also, there aren't a lot of sprint and midget drivers that have won the Daytona 500, but now you're the latest to have done that. And to know that 
you follow in the footsteps of guys like Mario Andretti and AJ Foyt and, he, and Ryan Newman who have done that here. How important is that to you to show to the grassroots of America that you can come from that type of background and win the Daytona 500? Yeah, it's special to me. Uh, I know, you know Kyle's done a lot for, for dirt track racing, open wheel racing, uh, Christopher Bell, you look at what Alex Bowman's doing now, going uh, back and forth and, and running sprint cars. I have a lot of fun running with my dad. We don't run as much as, as everybody else does, but um, definitely still a, a, a short track dirt, dirt racer. And um, I know how long and, and how you know, important this race was that you know, when Tony, my former boss, uh, you know, tried to win this race for a long time. And I looked up on the screen during you know, that one of those late cautions uh, when the eight was leading and they were showing you know, I think it was his 17th attempt, and you know it was our 12th. So uh, I know how hard it is for for guys to win this race, and um, it's nice to go ahead and get that that checked off the list. Keep it up in the press box. Jim Mutter, Motorsport.com. Congratulations, Ricky. Thank you. Um, Jody and Cad were in earlier, and were asked about and talked about uh, their long time involvement in the sport and the efforts they've made to keep going, even though that hasn't always translated into trips to Victory Lane. I just wondered, you sort of had what many would have called a breakout year, like in 2017, where you picked up a couple wins. Has it been difficult since then? What Have you felt at some point that you might uh, give up? I uh, definitely never thought about giving up. Um, you know, I felt like yeah, 2017 winning a couple races was huge for us. Uh, but I'll even look back at that season, and um, you know we still weren't super stellar. Um, you know we we had our ups and downs, but obviously two wins kind of uh, you know puts a bandaid on some of those things that uh, that you can overlook. But you know I think for me coming to JTG Dory Racing was a was a nice reset. Um, you know we had two cars at the time, uh, moved to a, a single car team, which I think has been beneficial. Um, we've been able to put a lot of focus uh, on the 47 car and uh, everybody in the shop. I feel like the details are, uh, you know, really paid attention to. We got some of the best guys in the shop. Uh, it's super, super neat to see, you know, how long, um, you know, Tad and Jody have been in the sport. Around our shop, you see, uh, you know, pictures of, you know, Tad going over the wall, you know, doing uh, jack man and tire changes and, um, you know they're they're out helping sponsors nonstop around here, and um, you know you, you partner them with Brad and, and Gordon and, and Mark. Uh, they they make a great team, and so it's super cool to you know get them in victory lane. We had a, a great moment this off season. I feel like at our team lunch, uh, had a video put together, and uh, you know it put some of JTG's wins in there, my wins in there, and um, you know kind of helped us realize that hey we can. We need these wins together and realize that we could do that. We've, we've, we've both done it um, in our past, and so it's it's special to do it together. Right next to Mark, then to Chris. Hey, Ricky, right here. Mark Long with AP. Obviously, it's a big milestone for you, but when you look at Jody and Brad, it's a milestone for NASCAR. How, how key is this thing for maybe the broader picture of, of where NASCAR's headed? Yeah, NASCAR's been doing a, such a great job of, um, you know, getting everyone involved in our sport and you know the even you know going out to areas of, of the country where uh, we're not so you know prominent in um, you look at LA going to Chicago um, you know getting getting down in um, you know some of the inner cities and, and getting you know those fans interested in NASCAR um, you know we've got a lot of diversity on our race team throughout the garage um, and it's it's cool to, to have two two on our race team and, and put them in victory lane here at the Daytona 500. Super special, and uh, you know NASCAR is you know leading the way in in a, in a big way. So um, you know it's uh, it's cool to play a small part of, of getting them to victory lane. Chris, hey Ricky, uh, first off, um, I just want to say congratulations on the uh, the awesome win. Um, uh, I saw on the replay there that you. Um, climbed up the fence after your victory there. I was wondering, uh, was that something you had thought about doing if you won this race, or was that kind of spur of the moment? I feel like you never try and think about what you're gonna do when you win a race, especially the Daytona 500, and um, my crew guys were out there. Uh, it was a bummer that I wasn't able to do a burnout because we didn't have any fuel left, um, so that was 
that was a bummer. Um, I'm sure the Hendrick Engine Shop appreciates that. But, um, you know, so when I won my first sprint car race, my dad climbed the fence. Um, and then my first ARCA win in 2008 at Kentucky, he was in the grandstands and we both climbed up the fence and met at the top. And then when I won Talladega, he climbed the fence on the back stretch uh, where he always watches the races there. And so got out there and the crew guys were like, hey, let's climb the fence. And then, you know, I did the interview and I turned around, they were gone. And uh, so I decided to go ahead and climb it uh, myself. So uh, yeah, just spur of the moment. Have any word from Tony Stewart or um, Helio Castroneves what they thought of it? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know Tony didn't do pull-ups when he got to the top. So. <laughs> Uh, I know Elio can definitely do pull-ups when he gets to the top. I've, I've done some workouts with him. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I haven't checked my phone to see if Tony said anything yet. Yeah. Thanks, Ricky. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll go with Mike and the Steve and the Daniel. <clears throat> Mike Henry from NBC. Ricky, do you come into this race every year assuming there will be a string of accidents in the last five or ten laps? And if so, do you, do you sort of steal yourself that you're going to have to make some quick decisions because of all that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at really any speedway race these days and, and they're all like that. Um, you know, every one of us out there know it's a really good opportunity to get to victory lane. Our cars are all comparable uh, on speed and, uh, you know, the draft is obviously it's, uh, you know, kind of an even playing field there for the most part. So, you know, when we were, when we lost our track position after I spent on pit road, I think we were 26. We were like 29th, and we were going to come in and top off, and um, you know maybe put some new tires on. But you know we know track position is so important. So Mike said, if five or six in front of us pit, let's stay out. That's just five or six less that we have to pass, you know, in a 14 lap run to the finish. And so we did that. I felt like it was a was a huge uh, you know strategy play to you know give us a shot. And then, yeah, it was chaos at the end. I mean, um, you know, I got a good restart on the top, jumped to the bottom, and there was cars bouncing off the wall, uh, bouncing off each other, somehow all keeping them going straight. But my line that I was in every time seemed to carry the momentum. And then all of a sudden I looked up and, you know, we were in, uh, I think, seventh at, at the time. And so after that, it, it got a little bit calmer, but we were all pushing each other like crazy. Um, you know, throughout the whole race, you're – you're pushing in key parts of the racetrack. You, you push once you get in the flat uh, off of turn two, get your momentum down the back stretch, you release uh, getting into turn three, and then you get close again, kind of through turn three and try and carry that momentum all the way back, you know, down the front stretch. Not a lot of bump drafting, and then, you know, a lot of bump drafting down the back stretch again. So I felt like everybody did a really good job of, you know, being smart and, you know, kind of methodical throughout the race. But when, you know, when you're in 10 to go, it's like we all lose our mind and just, you know, push the whole time. And uh, these cars are difficult to drive when, when you're getting pushed all the way around the racetrack. Steve. Steve Switzer, the last one. Uh, how uh, important do you feel um, the next-gen car um, and the, so to speak, leveling of the playing field? Um, Contributed or how important that was? Do you think uh, your race team being able to pull this off? This I think I don't think the this car um, helped us pull this off at Daytona. If you look, you know, my very first race here at, um, at Daytona, we sat on the pole uh, with the old school car, so uh, that was huge. And, and I felt like, you know, with with the, the older car, I felt like we had race cars capable of winning uh, while while being here at JTG Doherty Racing. I think the car going forward at, at other racetracks is um, where we feel like it helps, you know, kind of level the playing field to a point. Like I said, I think last season, the bigger teams learned at a faster rate. Um, you know, we, we hit on some stuff for about a month and, and felt really good. Uh, and then we kind of seemed to lose ground to, to some of those bigger teams. So. We look to make that jump this past off season. I feel like we've we've made the you know some big gains, and uh, we're looking forward to this car um, you know making competition you know more and more throughout throughout the season. Go next to Daniel at the Hound. 
Family Pet and Friendships.com. Ricky, in, in the years since you got your first two wins back in 2017, there's been a lot of like criticism and jokes made at your expense because of your aggressive driving style in these races and accidents you may or may not have caused. <coughs> on a night like this, on this stage, when everyone else is in the garage fixing torn up cars and you're across the finish line, not, not, at least not much of a scratch on your car, do you feel like you got the last lap tonight? Uh, I mean, obviously you're gonna have haters everywhere. Um, and when you have somebody, you know, at the time, uh, like Kyle Bush, you know, getting out and bashing you, uh, yeah, that's that's difficult to overcome. But um, you know, I mean, I feel like I've put myself in some bad spots, yeah, throughout throughout my career. But um, you know, the the faster we get our cars, the more I can take care of them and, and still run them close to the front. You know, something I've always tried to do, which is, you know, at you know sometimes an expense, is trying to take a car. Um, you know, and, and try and get way more out of it than, you know, than what's there. And so, you know, I feel like that's my job to do as a race car driver is to get, you know, the most speed out of a race car that you can. But, um, you know, also in this sport, you got to take care of it. And, you know, you can't, you can't just leave it all out there every single, every single race. Um, you know, so that's something that, you know, I felt like this off season we've, we've kind of met and, you know, Mike's, you know, super confident that he's, and what he can do and what our engineers and team can give me uh and you know we'll assess each weekend you know after practice and after qualifying you know what our goals are for for that given race day and you know so i think we'll do a better job of you know kind of set our, our realistic expectations each week and and i'll if we're if we feel like 15th is uh, where we need to be that given week, then that's where I'm gonna try and get the car to, and and not try and get it to tenth or fifth, uh, like I like I tend to do. So, um, you know, that's something that we're gonna be super focused on this year of, uh, you know, finishing races. Uh, you know, Mike brought up this off season, you know, back in the Nationwide Series when we had fast race cars. Uh, we in 2011 uh, we finished I think 98.9 percent of the laps, and in 2012 I think we finished 98.2 percent of the laps. Uh, and the only laps we didn't finish were crashes at super speedways. So we know that we can we can do that um, together as a race team, and, and we're looking forward to showing everybody that. And where's the party going to be tonight? I don't know yet. Um, at, yeah, at somewhere. Um, we will be here uh, for for a long time. <laughs> Congratulations, Ricky, on winning the Daytona 500. This is Alan Alfred from the Alan and Aaron Sports Radio Show. Throughout this whole week, I've heard drivers say that winning the Daytona 500 is circumstantial, but you just mentioned that you use a lot of strategy to win this race. Can you please explain that if you won the Daytona 500, what are your thoughts on what it takes to win this race? Definitely, I mean, definitely it's circumstantial at times, uh, but, you know, like I said earlier, you look, you look at the history of this race, uh, you look at the history of, of super speedway racing, um, and a lot of the same guys are towards the front and you know since 2016-ish I feel like we are you know some of those um, contenders that that are at the front of those races towards the end of the race and you know this race uh, it's a long race uh, the like I said the first stage we didn't have track position but I felt like I kind of went to school watching you know what the leaders were doing so that when I got there uh, you know I kind of knew what to expect and then you know, we, we got there and I felt really good uh, being in the top five there and, and at the end of that second stage. I felt like I pushed the 48 really well. Uh, the 48 won uh, and myself, I felt like really controlled, you know, some of the those those last few laps coming to the stage in. Uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, you gotta, it's circumstantial. You gotta, you gotta catch breaks at the right time. You gotta, you know, be able to, to make moves and your line's gotta go, but uh, you're also looking ahead. Your spotter's giving you all the information that he can uh, to make sure that you know you have all the info to, to figure out which lane to be in. Uh, there was there was times where you know Tad was telling me, "Hey, you know, get to the top lane, get to the top lane." He saw something that I couldn't see in the front that killed the bottom you know lane's momentum, uh, and it propelled us past you know four or five, and then you know we jump back to the bottom, things like that. So. Uh, definitely a lot of strategy involved um, in, in calculated moves. Wrap right here with Matt Weaver. 
Ken Weaver Motorsports team. I think Daniel kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but I want to kind of take it a little further. And I'm curious, you mentioned like in your Xfinity Championship days, really good car, not have to be as aggressive, take what the car gives you, all that stuff. So from that standpoint, do you think the last couple of years where it seems like every year we get to the end of the season and you're right there on the bubble points-wise or maybe even needing to win, do you feel like from day one you you're up against it, you have to raise more aggressive. And to that point, now that you start off this season with a win, presumably in the playoffs, now that edge is completely gone. Yeah, starting the season off with a win definitely changes, I feel like, uh, your mindset going forward. Um, but, you know, as we saw last year, uh, you've, you're going to have to gain some points. You're going to have to uh, stay ahead of you know, eventual winners in the point standings to, uh, you know, to make the playoffs. So, you know, I think this season you could see, you know, more winners than we had last year. And, and that being said, um, you know, we got to be on our A game from, from here on out. But like I said, I think everything that we've learned this off season, I've got a lot of confidence in the cars that my guys are going to be able to give me so that, you know, I don't have to overdrive them to, you know, get good finishes. And, and, you know, there'll be days that we'll finish, you know, 17, 18, but that might be our that might be our goal for that given weekend. Uh, we can't finish, you know, above 25th, right? I mean, that kills you at the point. So we're uh, we're wanting to be consistent. Um, you know, obviously, we we wanted to get a win. We we've we've done that, but we do feel like there's other racetracks that we're capable of winning at, um, based off of you know our performance at some last year and the things that we've learned this off season. So, um, yeah, I think mindset-wise, it, it definitely calms the nerves a little bit to you know, go out and really focus on what we're doing only. And then I know Mike woke up this morning with that conviction that you guys could do this. And, um, there was always that conviction that you guys could do this. But I feel like the cars you had has been in 2020, 2021 were really, really good cars. I don't think this car was quite as good as those cars. And I'm, and I'm curious, is the irony kind of not lost on you that um, you guys had arguably the best car here those two years, and you come back this year, qualify, and you're back to the field, and this is the year that you guys get it done? Yeah, it's crazy. We were, you know, our car in 2020 was amazingly fast. I think we shocked everybody with, you know, getting the pole uh, and, and had really good cars uh, those two years. You know, we came here last year and we qualified, I think, 24th. So we, we qualified 10 spots better, but we were second off the pole. Uh, we qualified 34th this year. We were seven and a half tenths off the pole. So technically, we were closer to the to the lead cars. It was just like everybody got faster, and, and we kind of fell back in, in positions. Uh, and so I told my guys after Wednesday, I said, you know, we have a we have a you know a a set kind of standard of like, hey, here's our qualifying for super speedways. We've set the bar. Now let's try and make that better going forward. But I said, guys, we're closer to the lead pack cars than what we were last year. And we were leading this race, uh, you know, with five or six to go. I said, we, we have a car capable of doing that. Uh, and we, like I said, we made adjustments um, that gave up a little handling and, and ride quality for a, for a little bit of speed. Uh, and I felt like in our Chevy draft uh, on Friday night, I felt super confident in the car. Again, maybe not the fastest, but I felt like I drafted well, it handled good enough for me. And I felt like that was always, you know, one of our benefits and, and kind of uh, key things to have here at Super Speedway races is cars that handle good. And, and being able to get pushed without, you know, getting too out of shape. And I felt like I had that. Well, Ricky, congratulations on winning the Daytona 500, and we'll see you next week in Fontana. Yes, can't wait. Thank y'all. <laughs>